Hello, my name is Justin Wagner. I am a graduate student at the University of Maryland College Park. And today I'll be talking about preliminary research on privacy preserving microbiome sequencing analysis and storage systems. So first, I'll talk about what microbiome sequencing is. So the goal of microbiome sequencing is to study and analyze communi microbial communities that can't easily be cultured in the lab. So the main unit of study is to uh, use clusters of similar DNA sequences that are extracted from an environmental sample. And these are called operational taxonomic units. So you'll hear this OTU throughout the talk. Um, and I just want to make sure that I, I get it off in the first slide. That is simply we're collecting, data, uh, collecting a sample from the environment and then uh, having similar sequence of DNA. And that's an operational taxonomic unit. So the pipeline for micro, uh, microbiome sequencing is to first collect a microbial community sample. So that'll be, for instance, from your, um, from a body site on an individual. So your skin, your uh, mouth, or your gut cavity. Second is to extract the DNA from that sample. So this will involve removing any organic or inorganic matter that isn't DNA. Third is to amplify and sequence the 16S rRNA gene. So this is a specific genetic marker that's going to be used in microbiome sequencing. So it's an important genetic marker because it codes for part of the ribosome. So the ribosome is a required cellular structure in all living cells. An important piece of the, an important characteristic of the 16S rRNA gene is that any, any identical genome, so any bacteria of the same strain and species, will have the same copy of this genetic marker and any bacteria that isn't of the same genome will have a different copy. So these uh, 16S RNA genes are sequenced, and then similar sequences are grouped into an operational taxonomic unit. Um, and then finally, to identify what these operational taxonomic units represent, for example, species or just a, a genus sample, they're mapped against uh, databases that contain sequences and annotations. For instance, you would get an OTU that represents E. coli, and then one of these three data databases would contain the sequence for E. coli for the 16S rRNA gene, and then the actual name E. coli species strain. So microbiome sequencing is used in a number of ongoing projects. The first is the Human Microbiome Project. It's similar to the Human Genome Project. The goal of the project is to sequence and characterize healthy human microbiome and then release data sets and tools to an enable analysis. The Personal Genome Project is an interesting project. And the goal with that is to release patient genome, microbiome, and health records uh, to enable researchers to um, correlate gen genomic and microbiome variants and uh, health outcomes. Third is the American Gut Project, which is characterizing human microbiome. And uh, another one is the Global Enterics Multicenter Study. So the goal is to study childhood diarrheal diseases in developing countries. So similar to how uh, genomics is used to study the genomes of everybody, metagenomics studies microbiomes. So the main question is examining the differences in microbial communities between health, healthy and disease individuals. So this figure is from a recent study, or this figure is from a recent paper from the um, Childhood Diarrheal Disease Study. It gives an overview of some of the main points of metagenomics. So one on the left is going to be the different bacteria that are seen at the genus level. And then on the right, you can see case and control. So patients that exhibited childhood diarrheal disease and those, with, those that didn't. Uh, this data set also cared about uh, the time sequence and the country of origin. So the objectives for the talk today are to, one, introduce key metrics and statistical, text, statistical tests in metagenomic analysis. Two is to characterize re-identification concerns if we're going to be, if we're going to be posting metagenomics data and is this a risk to patients or not. Um, three is to study the applicability of proposed privacy preserving schemes for the analysis of genomics data and see if they can be um, applied to metagenomics data. And then fourth is to outline the specific requirements of uh, generating privacy preserving systems operating on genomics data. So the four key metrics in metagenomics are what I'm going to go over next. They're all going to be computed on a table similar to this. So you're going to have samples from patients 
You're going to split those up into case and control groups, and then you're going to choose a specific OTU to study across those case and control groups. So the first metric is going to be just presence or abundance of an OTU. Um, and this is just going to be was the OTU uh, count above a certain level at that element in the table. The statistical test that we're going to care about if an OTU present versus absent associates with case and control group membership is going to be the chi-square test. The chi-square table is going to be generated as follows, where you have how many times an OTU was seen in the case population and the control population, and then likewise for if it was absent. And the chi-square statistic will be generated as follows. The next metric is the abundance or quantity of uh, OTU. And does that correlate with, um, or does that significantly differ between case and control groups? So the mean abundance for an OTU is going to be generated as follows. And so that's going to be done for both the case and control groups. And then the variance for that OTU is going to be calculated as well. The next two metrics in metagenomic analysis are going to be alpha diversity. So how much, given one sample, do the, um, are the OTUs represented? How even are they? So um, the actual distribution of um, OTUs. And then how rich is the sample? And so that means how many total OTUs that are already known are present in that sample. So there's two key indices that are uh, calculated for, uh, to describe alpha diversity. And they are the Shannon's index, which is calculated using the uh, fraction of a single OTU um, compared to the total number of OTUs in that sample and then the Simpsons index. So again, similar to abundance, uh, the two-sample T statistic is going to be calculated to examine the difference, uh, the significance of the differences between case and control groups. The final metric of uh, metagenomic analysis I'm going to talk about today is the beta diversity. So beta diversity just looks at, given two samples, how similar are they based on their OTU makeup? Um, the Bray-Curtis similar dissimilarity index is uh, one of the main uh, measures of beta diversity. And again, the two-sample t-test will be used to test the difference between case and control groups. So now that I've gone over the metagenomics analysis, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask the question, is, uh, is releasing patients' microbiome for public study, is that going to present a similar hazard as releasing patients' whole human genome sequences? Uh, so the, the concerns with whole human genome sequences is that the genome itself can act as a unique, unique identifier of an individual, and re-identification is possible given a publicly posted data set. And um, the earlier presenter today talked about the two studies that have, or the three studies that have analyzed that. But the, uh, the understanding of the genome being a unique identifier is based on three metrics. So first, a well-estimated rate of genome variation between individuals a defined number of sites where each individual can vary. So it's going to be a 3.2 billion characters of the human genome. And then specifically, there's known regions where you're more likely to see a specific variant. And then th the third important factor is that given any single variant that we know about in the population, how likely is it that an individual is going to carry one of a number, set of, uh, one of, a number of copies of that variant? Um, so for the picture with microbiome data, uh, just given the point of the research stage, uh, these three metrics aren't clear. So a uh, good understanding of are these microbiome sequences unique identifiers uh, can't easily be um, calculated yet. Um, and it's mainly due to the fidelity of transfer of microbiome from uh, parent to offspring. And that, that mechanism isn't quite understood yet. But there have been projects that have looked uh, spe specifically at forensic analysis based on microbiome data. Um, for instance, Ferrer uh, matched the microbial community on a keyboard to a person's fingertip. So what I aimed to do was to examine the re-identification empirically. So look at a given data set that's already been posted. And the first question I'm going to ask is, do the, does this OTU abundance and also, if I transfer it to presence absence matrix, does it uniquely separate individuals in a, in a data set? So this will form the underpinning of, can I find a microbial fingerprint to uniquely identify people? And then that would say, 
we shouldn't be posting these data sets publicly because I can identify somebody's fingerprint. So um, that, would, that would form the, the underpinning for that. Um, so the data set that I looked at was from the Personal Genome Project. Uh, so they released microbiome sequencing results. Uh, this data set had 87 individuals sampled at the forehead, right palm, left palm, mouth, and gut. Um, and so uh, another project, actually the American Gut Project, uh, released uh, the, the uh, analyzed the data set and uh, performed OQ clustering and classification and came to the conclusion that there were 12,000 or so OTUs that were present in, uh, across the samples in the data set. So my work, uh, I saw that for the OTU abundance matrix, so how many counts for each OTU, uh, there were no identical samples across all body sites of all individuals. Uh, so that was each column vector was unique. And then also changing those uh, raw counts to presence absence, uh, there were no identical um, samples again. So these represent the maximal OTU fingerprint to separate samples in this data set. So there's a number of pieces of ongoing work that I'm going to be performing, which is first, uh, looking at this uh, maximal OTU fingerprint, seeing if this maximal OTU fingerprint exists on other data sets. Um, and then two is gonna be computing beta diversity to check that all samples for one individual are more similar to that individual than for any other individual. Um, and then finally, uh, I have a goal of finding a minimal OTU fingerprint to separate samples in this data set. So next, I'm going to talk about existing privacy-preserving schemes that operate on genomics data. Um, so the first one is looking at across uh, multiple samples, uh, can we perform a, a privacy-preserving genome-wide association study? So last year, Com et al. proposed a secret sharing scheme um, to use between biobanks to perform some uh, chosen statistical tests without releasing patients' genome sequences. So a brief overview of secret sharing is that two parties, A and B, can take a value that they do not want to publicly share and compute a specified function over that data. Um, so this is going to be used, uh, this is, this is going to be based on jittering shares of that, of that secret value that they care about and then um, sending those shares to data hosts which will then compute the function. So Calm et al. showed that given um, an implemented uh, secret sharing scheme that they had done, uh, they could perform a chi-square test and use that for, to test the association between an exposure to a specific SNP and the case and control group membership for individuals. So this test, the chi-square test, can be performed on a secret shared database of genome data from the two institutions. So a view of the contingency table is here. Um, so you're going to split up into case and control memberships, and for the single nucleotide polymorphism test, you're going to, um, the authors proposed that um, instead of storing the SNPs similar to the earlier presenter did, you're actually just going to store counts for how many times the variant uh, was seen, how many copies of the variant that an individual had uh, versus the normal expected um, nucleotide at that position. And then this is the secret shared database. So um, the, uh, the variant versus wild type allele will be coded um, as counts of how many times that copy, uh, how many times those copies were seen. Um, so the uh, index vectors con containing the case and control group membership can be uh, generated on the secret shared data or uh, generated beforehand. Um, and then the contingency table counts can be performed on the secret shared data as follows. And then finally, the author showed that the chi-square statistic can then be computed on this secret shared data. Um, and then their scheme was implemented in a additive 32-bit um, integer secret sharing scheme. So floating point arithmetic wasn't natively supported, so they ended up uh, to compare against the test statistics against a p-value, they ended up um, performing some arithmetic to uh, perform integer comparison. 
So what I've done is say that I believe that the chi-square test can be used to test the association between the specific OTU and case and control group membership using the scheme that was outlined by COM et al. So the contingency cable, instead of allele counts, will just be the present absence. Um, the secret shared database will contain one table, which is just how many times was that OTU present or absent. Um, the same scheme for uh, sharing the index vectors will be uh, will give me case and control groups, and then the contingency table counts can be generated as follows, and the chi-square statistic could then be uh, calculated and tested against p-value. So the other, uh, one of the other metrics that we cared about in metagenomic analysis was the abundance. Uh, so I looked, I, I've, I've been looking to see if um, uh, abundance can be calculated, um, or the abundance test can be computed, um, and it appears that uh, if the uh, microbiome data can be uh, set up similar to how it was in the other scheme, um, and then I can still secret share the index vectors to give me case and control groups, I can compute the mean abundance and variance for both the case and control groups on this data, um, and then I would have a two-sample T statistic to test the differences between the case and control groups for this mean abundance. Um, one issue that arises is that uh, this this involves uh, quite a bit more floating point arithmetic and uh, division, and so uh, I might either, the authors talked about how slow that is for their scheme, so either I'll just need to uh, verify the speed of it and it's accept if it's acceptable or not, or then um, or use a different uh, multi-party computation scheme. So one concern with this metagenomics analysis, de analysis data, and specifically usually for secret sharing across data or across biobanks, is that uh, metagenomics data or metagenomics statistical testing needs to be possible at any arbitrary level of the taxonomic tree. So this tree was a rough representation of the tree of life. Uh, tree of life is not necessarily uh, binary or symmetric, but the goal was to show that this cut is any arbitrary cut through the tree. So again, those OTUs were classified against a taxonomy. So the first, the taxonomy can change. Uh, that just goes on with um, common, uh, at the end of major sequencing projects. Um, and then also, I would, I would like to ask either at the species level, the genus level, or higher up in the hierarchy, um, how do the um, OTU abundance or any of the other uh, metagenomics um, statistics vary between case and control groups. So finally, uh, the last scheme I'll talk about um, was uh, for secure storage and computation of disease risk. So this was done by uh, IDEA at last year's Health Tech. Uh, so they, pro they proposed using properties of an additive homomorphic encryption scheme to compute the disease risk of an individual without fully decrypting the genome to any party. So the basics of the scheme was that a patient would share their DNA sample to a certified institution, so a sequencing center, that would then uh, sequence the individual's genome and then uh, send the encrypted data to a storage and processing unit. Um, and then also the patient would interact with a medical unit, so for instance, a physician's uh, office, um, who would then ask um, how likely is it that this individual, given their uh, set of SNPs is going to develop a disease or not. Um, and so they proposed several, ski, or, um, several properties to allow the SNP vector to stay encrypted um, and then use homomorphic addition and secure integer comparison to allow for the computation of the disease risk based on the odds ratios for each of the SNPs associated with that disease um, and then uh, devise the person's uh, disease risk. And so it appears that with uh, expanding to microbiome sequencing, uh, I believe that the SNP vector encryption scheme and the homomorphic addition of odds ratios can be translated to OTU uh, presence and absence uh, metric. So ongoing work on my, my part is to understand how to uh, perform the disease risk computation with uh, the abundance and diversity metrics. And then also one issue is that with long-term storage of microbiome data is that I'll need to re-update uh, the OTU classifications any time a major sequencing project finishes, and those sequences, uh, for instance, that sequence of E. coli um, changes to a different strain or, se or species. So in conclusion, microbiome sequencing data and metagenomic analysis techniques present unique challenges compared to genome data. So I looked at re-identification concerns. Um, I showed, I 
overviewed uh, a secret sharing scheme to allow for um, population-wide analysis of if a uh, uh, microbiome data is associated with disease. And then also, I looked at the feasibility of uh, secure storage and computation disease risk. I'd like to thank my advisor, Hector Carrado Bravo, for its help with this. Thank you. All right, thank you, Justin. Okay, uh, we have a little bit of time for, I think, I ha is that a question? Yeah, yeah go on. Uh, come up, uh, stand up uh, at the mic and name and affiliation, right. please. Uh, Murat Kantar, Joel, uh, University of Texas at Dallas. My question is in the SNP or the GWAS type of studies, there is also this, uh, the SNPs disclose some information about potential diseases, etc. So is there any such concerns of information disclosure here other than the identification? So that's, uh, that's another uh, avenue that I'm going to try to be looking at, which is, for instance, um, just even seeing a specific microbiome signature is going to say that he currently has this disease. There are some, just, some diseases that are just caused by a bacteria being present. So that's going to be a concern that, yes, uh, similar to how SNPs give you disease likelihood, just presence of an OTU will likely also um, give some give away information about uh, individual susceptibility to a disease. All right. Any other questions? All right. Okay. Well, let's thank Justin again. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much.